We're recording. Okay. How'd you find me? So, um, I was looking up self-help um, videos up on YouTube, and I stumbled upon, uh, upon your videos. Um, and it's been, I think, about, like, six months now. So I've been, like, watching a lot of your... So uh, are you in my Patreon account? No, I'm not. So you've just been watching what I posted, like, a long, a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Have you watched any of my, my recent short clips that I posted? Yeah. Can you tell those are a little different than the ones I posted? Yeah. Like, you have, like, preview before and, like, you want to watch the whole thing. Like, yeah, but, the, but the, the content, have you noticed the content? Besides the HCG stuff, the content is really direct compared to what I was doing when I first started and still was kind of learning myself how to do it, how to communicate, how to guide people. Anyway, so uh, self-help uh, with respect to what? So um, I've kind of struggled with binge eating for a really long time. Um, I was, there was a period of time where I was bulimic and then I kind of got over that and then it's just, I should just feel like binge eating has, it just, won't go away. Okay, so, so really quick, how often are you dieting? Like implementing um, a... Okay, so I've kind of stopped doing the dieting. Um, it's kind of a long story. Like, should I... I don't know if I should... How I should, like, go about this. Like, if I should... Let's start just start with where you're at right now. The Because okay. the history, as much as it's, like, it's interesting, it's not necessarily... Um, we don't need to rehash everything Whatever it is, this is where you're at. We can say it's all to some degree promoted where you're at today and why you haven't recovered yet, you know. Um, so there's a couple things I want to know. So how your how this is behaviorally manifesting. So it's behaviorally manifesting in the binging process, which is a sign that you still are somewhat dieting in your mind. You're still holding you're still holding yourself to food restrictive concepts, right? doesn't mean you're actively restricting. It just means you still hold yourself to it. And, and you are feeling bad about yourself for not yeah. being able to comply, right? Like I'm a horrible person. I can't comply. I'm a failure. I've ruined it. I'm going to gain weight today. Anyways, I might as well the floodgates open, you have a moment of freedom from shame and guilt, but then you have the pressure to somehow balance out the weight gain that's going to occur, right? Yes. Does that kind of basically sum it all up for you right now where you're at? True. Like I'm Binge not eating, necessarily yeah. following like a diet plan. No. Like there was a period of time where I used to like count calories. I've done every diet under the sun. Like I'm, I'm just kind of over that. It's just, um, I guess for, for me right now, it's just a matter of emotionally eating and um, just trying to detach my need to comfort, you know, to just comfort myself with food from mm -hmm. whatever's happening in my life. I just can't seem to make that disconnect. Like, I just yeah. always resort back to, like, back to food and wanting to eat myself to make myself feel better. And yeah. then when I do gain weight, you know, it's like, I want to compensate for it, but like, I, I guess I just try to exercise more. Like, okay. So you're exercising, that's your dieting. Okay. So yeah. that's important. Those are the enablers. Yeah. Plan, yeah. So quick. So what would happen? And this is just, I want you to really think about this and be serious when you think about it. What would happen if you were, could not exercise? There was no possible way for you to exercise, move at all, or well, so let's start there. What would happen? Well, I try to restrict my eating. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're, you're dieting. So this is where a lot of people go, oh, I'm not dieting. Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are. If you're exercising to make up, and you use the word compensate, you're right, for the damages that your food consumption is doing, those are the enablers. Okay. Those have to be removed. They have to be removed. So now I'm going to ask the next step, which is, okay, so you know, as soon as we eliminate exercise from possibility, what would happen if we also eliminated food restriction? So you were forced to eat adequately. Adequately. Mm -hmm. 
cannot under eat, cannot. And you're, and you have to eat normal, like a normal human being. I would just not feel good about myself. To I describe guess. it. Cause that's, that's like, that's not good enough. I want a better description. <laughs> there's a, there's a part of me that tends to like want to like hide from people because like I'm ashamed. I don't want them to like see that I've gained weight and um, okay, hold on. You skipped a, you yeah. skipped ahead a little bit. You skipped ahead a little bit because the the ultimate outcome that you think would happen, right? If we remove all exercise and remove all dieting, and you know you cannot purge, you cannot puke, and you're forced to eat like a normal human being, what would happen? Your first reaction was to assume you're going to gain weight. Yeah. Okay. Just keep in mind you're not binging. Okay. But even though, even then, you still feel that you're naturally going to be gaining weight, right? Yeah. That's how I felt too. It's it's kind of sounds crazy when you're hearing it. You're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not binging. Right. Yeah. But it feels that way emotionally. So there's a disconnect between the intellect. Would you agree the intellect, how much weight would you gain if you ate like a normal person? Well, Remember, if you're eating like a normal person, I'm assuming that you won't be. Well, what what does the intellect say? You might gain some. I don't know. Yeah. What 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 is your answer? There's no right answer. I just want you to tell me what your thought is about it. Yeah, I mean, like if I'm eating like a normal person, I guess like the body will just naturally like adjust. Like yep. there's no. It, It'll become what it is naturally. Yeah. Like what it is truthfully, to be honest with you, that's a good word would be the truth of the body that you're in. It would become whatever that truth is. Right. And then the next thing it would be, how do you feel about that? How would that make you feel? So beyond the assumption that you're going to gain weight, because there's an assumption there. How does it make you feel? Would you like to know how it made me feel? I felt like my skin was crawling and I needed to rip it off my body. It felt like I was going to, like I was raging. It was, there was a rage underneath it all that I had to remove. It was intense um, anger and not only that, but I have to do something. And if I can't do something, I'm going to blow up. I'm literally going to blow up. I'm going to hurt. I, yeah. Like I feel that too, but I also tend to like, yeah, do it at the same time. Like, totally. For me, so my life is terrible. Yeah. Because I have to be fat. Yeah. Yeah. So most people, have you gotten help at all? Have you ever reached out for help besides reaching out to help for me? I've, I've reached out to help for um, other things and like self-esteem, and, but so, I've never like addressed Disorders. Okay, so you haven't been to like an eating disorder clinic. No. You haven't gone to a therapist that specializes in it. Okay. No. I have. Um, I've read this book. It's called um, Brain Over Binge yeah. by Kathy Hansen, and that really like. I've never. Changed. Yeah, I've never. I actually have never read it, but so many people have told me it's like, oh, that person made the connection with the binging too and survival mechanisms. That like made me quit like the bulimia aspect of it, but it's just the, the connection between, you know, the emotional eating and that has no, I just still can't get rid of that. You know, well, the eating that you're doing comes from the feeling that you need to be thin. So have you watched any of my YouTube videos where I talk about that Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I've heard of it, but no, I Okay, so this is actually really important in terms of the in, in understanding it. It's not going to change your behavior, but it'll help you understand it a little bit better. Each and every one of us human beings on the face of this planet are genetically and our DNA has hardwired into it a psychological um, behavior. We, we're very similar to other mammals. That we're very predictable. We're territorial. We're we're tribal animals. We like to be in packs of people um, in general, you know, and uh, we're all very predictable around how we respond to being judged and criticized and abandoned and rejected and all that stuff. 
So Maslow is a doctor. Abraham Maslow studied human behavior. And he published in the 1960s um, his major theory on human behavior. Um, and we, most people, when you look up Abraham Maslow, you'll see pictures of the triangle, the pyramid that is called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What he theorized, and it is still, it's foundational psychology, human behavior psychology, and it's still taught, it's still being looked at and kind of rearranged a little bit, but in general, it's just genius. At least the lower levels are, are the same as what he, pre, he, he, um, he theorized, and then the upper levels of this behavioral model are what's kind of being thrown around. But anyway, so this is why this is so important to you. The foundation of human psychology is wired. So before everything else, before anything else, you, me, all of my children, we're all wired to want to feel safe and secure with food above everything else. So if you're not safe and secure with food, your psychology is wired to become obsessed about it because it's physiologically important to survive. Food, water, right? Those physiological requirements to keep us alive, our brains and our psyche and our conscious awareness are hardwired to focus on those things if we feel or perceive there's something, there's a threat to it. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it, really. If we feel threatened based on our food and water supply, we will become like raging animals. So some of that is not, you're not crazy. Like you're behaving actually the way you're wired to. That's kind of cool to think about. It's, there's no, there's nothing wrong with you. The problem is what's triggering this? right? The, the, the trigger to this obsessiveness around food and trying to get food and keep food and hoard food is the, that your food has been, been threatened. There's something threatening your food supply, not just the ability to eat today, but the ability to restock food so that they've looked at food and kind of created a, a needs analysis around how, how we're wired around food. And it's, we want to know we have food today, we have enough food. So there's a psychological awareness around quantities and, and how much we feel. And we want to have enough to feel that we're safe to not worry about it. Um, and the other thing is, can we get more? So the, the, the perception that food is going to go away and you're not going to be able to get more is very triggering to this mechanism. Um, as well as, is it safe to eat and does it taste good? All of those are threatened for you, every single one. So what do you think anybody under the circumstance would do <laughs> if they can't eat today, they don't have enough today, they cannot get to more tomorrow, what they are eating is not okay, it's not safe, and what you do have to eat doesn't taste good. What do you think is going to happen? You're not, you're not crazy. You're actually normal. You're doing exactly what we would expect for someone in a third world environment. Do you know what a third world environment is? You don't live in one and that's why it's so confusing. If you lived in a third world environment, would we be judging your behavior with food? Then saying, oh, you have a binge eating disorder. You'd be like, no shit, Sherlock. She's going to, of course. And the fact that she thinks that food is going to go away forever, she's going to eat the whole thing. That makes so much sense. I know you're not crazy. You're not. I feel, I feel it's been a real, um, people have lost perspective around this basic fundamental human percept, like behavior. It's so obvious when you take a step back and look at your behavior, clearly you're in a third world state of mind in relation to food. So how are we going to get this food behavior to go away? Well, we need to get rid of the third world trigger. It's not your behavior. It's because your behavior is what we would expect under the circumstance. So what is promoting this behavior? Well, what's threatening your food? 
Starts with a D. Ends with a T. And then there's an I and an E in the center. Diet. Your diet. 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 Sorry. It's okay. Starts with a D, ends with a T, with an I and an E in the middle. Diet. Okay. Yeah, or just food restriction. And not only that, but the diet industry has used a lot of fear-based propaganda to get people to follow what they're doing. They're triggering this response to huge populations of people. That's bad. That's bad. That's dangerous. You shouldn't eat that. It's going to cause cancer. You know, the amount of inflammatory propaganda and media is everywhere. It's everywhere. Right. And so what do you think that does to someone's psyche? Yeah, I, it's, it's something that just like, I, I just, for me, like from childhood, like that's so true because like my mom, at least like, um, she had like ulcerative colitis. And, oh yeah. Um, she had her thyroid removed. And so a lot of the times, like the justification she give, um, to keep with the dieting and like make sure you look thin and stuff is because of health. And so I'm just, it, I don't know. Like it's just, well, that makes you know? a lot of sense to me where this is stemming from. Yeah. Cause your yeah. mom and actually if, with ulcerative colitis, that's a horrible, horrible situation yeah. where food is actually, it's like, yeah. So, yeah. And like, especially growing up, um, like, I come from, like, a Middle Eastern background, like, culturally, so there's, like, a huge emphasis placed on, like, women and making sure that they, you know, look good and you have to be thin. And yeah, and that's everywhere. It's not just in Middle East. It's it's called misogyny, patriarchy. It's it's yeah. men are is superior and women, what they bring to the table is sex. I know it's really, it's really archaic, but it is what it is. And we could say to some degree, there's some human nature involved in and how that works, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Um, the problem is someone like you and what I used to do is I complied to it. I actually believed it was a fact and therefore supported it. Don't we yeah. all want to be thin and sexy and look like porn stars? <laughs> Isn't that what we all should aspire to be and do? But that's what's modeled, right? And so that's also very forgivable. So you can see it as a child in your, in your mom, it's just, yeah. What do you, did, she didn't know any different. That's what she believed it. It's like passing down hardcore religion. It's the same thing. You know, at some point someone has to question it and go, hold on. This is really, look at what's happening. So one of the things that I, um, I, it will be in the book that's published. I, when I talk about body image, I use the example of foot binding. Oh, the Chinese foot binding. In China. I think it was over a thousand years. It was think of how many generations actually taught this to their innocent children, both boys and girls were taught that a woman's worth is based on the smallness of her foot and the smaller the foot symbolizes her willingness to work hard, to be determined, to, um, prove she's valuable and she wants it enough. And so you can see how they symbolize that woman to be a superior human being because of her ability to have pain, to be, to deal with pain, to be okay with pain and to focus. And it means she knows how to rap, which means she's got talent. I mean, there's so much symbolism around the smaller the woman's foot. Do you know what size of foot they actually admonished and loved? Like a ridiculous, like, baby size. Three like, inches was oh the God. premier. No. <laughs> yeah. We're talking, what, one, two, three. So maybe here. Wow. Maybe the size of this right here. Oh yeah. No, that, that was like you were, you would get the richest man. So, you know, think about the women today are doing the same thing with their lip injections up to go this way and they've got their fake eyelashes and they've got everything they're doing to try to promote. It's basically money. It's a, it's a financial value to be, to look like a porn star, to look like, you know, it's a sign of, of wealth. And, and so it's, what's the difference? <laughs> There's not much. I mean, so if you had a foot at the time that was larger than five inches, 
you were worthless. You were seen as you're probably never going to get married. No one's going to like you. It's a sign that you're lazy, don't care, um, that you don't want it enough, that you don't um, have the skills to wrap and bind your feet, right? So I feel like I, I am experiencing those same things, except instead of foot binding, it's just being overweight. It's called body binding. You're supposed to starve yourself. You're supposed to bind your body with starvation, but that starvation is a third world star starved state. And so psychologically, if we were dumb, we could do it. But the human species wouldn't have survived over tens of thousands of years if we didn't have the mechanisms in place to feast before famine. Right? I mean, so you're basically saying, I mean, it would have been easier to foot bind. Because at least you're not triggering those survival mechanisms with food. Right? <laughs> so when you think about how complicated this is, that it's like, okay, you're supposed to body bind with starvation. So it's not like, and there are wraps, by the way. They do sell wraps to make you skinny. And they've done, and it's, it's actually changed, you know, we can look at history and say, well, the same thing occurred in the ancient times, you know, with Egypt and the fact that they had, they shaved their heads back then because of pestilence and, and lice and all that. So they, everybody just shaved their head and only a rich could afford wigs. So the types of wigs showed your value and your worth and the makeup and everything that they do to try to separate, you know, to try to say, I'm better than you. I'm richer than you. I have more value than you. And the symbolism around body image has just been since probably the beginning of time. And we can sit here and judge it, right? We can sit here and be like, that's so fucked up. Like what? But the reality of it is how much of this is human survival mechanisms around feeling safe, relative to the way someone looks. So it's a very easy way to a superficial way to test, to see if you can assimilate with that. Or are they in my tribe? You know, so by wearing different clothing to separate yourself to say, am I safe or am I, am I not safe? You know? And so that type of wiring that we all have is really relative to survival mechanisms. So we can sit here and judge it all. But the reality of it is, is people who are in a state of survival mode, are going to be reaching for something like that to feel safe. Right. So we can, so it's, we can even sit here and say, well, actually your desire to be thinner isn't the problem because thinness is irrelevant, right? It's just a physical attribute. It's like your feet are small, your feet are big. Who gives a fuck, right? right. It's the symbolism that has to, you have to, to let go of. So for you to recover from this, because so going back to what's triggering this, foundational psychological wiring. I mean, your whole entire brain function will shut off to fixate on food. It's the foundation of your psychological wiring. Everything becomes insignificant if your food is threatened. So when people have binge eating disorder, that's what's, that's what's happening. It's not that, and that, but it gets more complicated. So why is it being threatened? Well, because you're, you believe you should be restricting. Well, that's understandable because you're trying to offset or compensate for the binging. Right, right. But why would you do that? Because. Because you need to be thin. Or just thinner. Just thinner. Just connecting some dots for you right now. Yeah. Again, this isn't going to make you recover. It's just giving you some like, oh, yeah. my God, this makes sense. I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. I don't believe you have a disorder. As much as we use that language to define it, I just feel like this is like a human survival syndrome. You're in survival mode. And your way to try to feel better about um, am I lovable? Am I? Can I be accepted into a tribe? Am, and can my tribe accept me? Is, well, maybe if I suck, if I'm a sucky human being at the heart of me, if I'm, if I'm a failure, well, if I'm thin, I'll feel better about it. And they will think I'm a failure. So it's like that superficial way of saying I'm a safe person to be with. And your, your way um, and your culture's way and my culture's way and many cultures around the, the world is to believe at this point, thinner women are superior women. Even though you're starving, your brain functions are lower, you literally 
can't focus on anything. Everything is repressed around your thyroid, your adrenals. You're more likely to die. You're more likely to have the disease. And on top of that, <laughs> you're more likely to have binge eating problems, which actually promote body weight gain, which creates a vicious cycle around the dieting and the de deprivation, the weight gain dieting. So how do you escape all this? That's what I'm trying to figure out. It's just not getting <laughs> to the source of like... Well, let me help you for a second. And you might not yeah. want to hear it. You're going to have to be okay being fat. And the symbolism around it. So you have to be okay. So imagine you're in China and it's like 200 years ago and your feet are five freaking inches. How are you going to recover? How do you get your life back? How do you get freedom so you can walk again because you can't walk you can't function so that's the other part of it you might as well be physically disabled because you're totally disabled psychologically right so the body you have is really useless you won't even go out and do things with it so you might as well not have a body you're totally disabled do you see that so you're not physically literally disabled but you're psychologically disabled and limiting your whole life. You might as well be disabled because you are. Right. And so, you know, when they foot bound, they made you disabled. You couldn't go anywhere. You can't walk. Right. Because if you walk on your feet, they might spread out. You might get bigger feet. Right. Right. So if you eat, oh my God, you're going to totally lose your thin supremacy. People will know that you're, 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 you're a bad person, you know, so you have to really go into that. What would happen if you really think about this here? What would change in your life? If you found out, let's imagine that I'm a, I can tell your future, okay? Just play with me here. You're never going to be thinner, ever. Your body isn't meant to be thinner. Your genetics, your DNA, the thousands and tens of thousands of years of body that came through your lineage is not meant to be frail like a 12-year-old girl. Think about that for a second. What if that, what if that's true? Just go there. Well, if it's, if it's true, then I'm like doing this to myself for no reason. Yeah. Well, you're, you could continue to do this for an illusion. You could be thinner, but it requires you live in isolation and anorexia your whole life to maintain it. So there is no destination of freedom that you're going to get from it. So your natural body is, let's just add 20 pounds to what you have. The real body that if you let your ancestors lineage come through, that kept the bodies alive. I mean, think of tens of thousands of human beings that came before you that promoted what you have today. It's clearly done something right. So, you know, the whoever ancestors genes that you had, a hundred years ago, did, did she have to feel like this and isolate her life and destroy every piece of freedom she had? How come she got to have a good time with her life? Why did she get to not feel bad about it? Make sense? Just think about that for a second. So if you just found out, guess what, honey? You're never going to be that thin. If you want freedom, you'll never, ever be that thin. You're not thin. You'll never be thin. It's just not your genetics. How would that, what would change in your life? I don't care how shitty this feels. Be honest with yourself. Um, like I wouldn't want to just waste all that time trying to 
chase an illusion and I know nothing's going to change. So, like, I'm just going to give up on trying to chase that. But I'm still, like, it's hard to let go of that illusion when that illusion is all you've ever known. Like, well, so what would ha what would happen? I mean, basically you're saying, I want to stay in misery, Rob, and I really don't want to recover. Because this is what I know. I want to stay in hell. I don't want to say no. Okay, so the, if you want recovery, do you think you're going to get it by obsessing over a thinner body? That requires that you starve. You clearly aren't, you have to starve to do it. It's not even truthful. Yeah. If you have to starve to get there, is it actually even truthful? It's not. It's a big fucking lie. You're lying to yourself and everybody around you. Cause you could lose all this weight and, but are you going to tell everybody that you're anorexic and obsessed about it? Okay. So the, like, in the past, like, I feel like, um, when I started to become bulimic, I had lost, um, a lot of weight mm -hmm. and it was like miserable, but <laughs> I had received so many like compliments and like, yeah, but did they, did they, so good and like, would they have complimented you if you told them the truth about what you were doing? So you were lying to everybody. You just, I was lying. I was. And like, yes. So I keep just, that in mind. So all those compliments, if people knew, well, what it took for me to get here is mental obsession with thinness. And I had to starve myself. And when I do eat, I puke it up. Are you still proud of me? They'd be mortified. Yeah. They wouldn't, you, wouldn't they rather you be fat? It's just, I feel like there's like a small window of time where, um, you know, like I was okay with, like, I just try to suppress the fact that I was basically torturing myself to get to that point. But I feel like mentally, like I was able to like think about other things rather than just obsessing over how fat I was because I wasn't technically fat. Yes. Yeah. Read up literally freed up and I could like focus on other things but it was just so exhausting to keep up and I just yeah physically I, I just yeah. couldn't do more like yeah. you know like it's so it's impossible it's not actually realistic it's an it's illusion yeah that. yeah so even if you get to the destination okay so I yeah. talk about this like you're chasing a mirage right you know what a mirage is yeah okay so you there's the mirage and I know it's there. I believe it's there. And you're chasing it. And you're chasing it. And it gets further and further away. And well, guess what? One time you starved yourself enough. You isolated yourself enough. You were obsessed enough that you, you actually reached it, but it keeps on moving away from you. Right. Fuck. I got to keep on doing this. It doesn't actually exist. The fantasy that I'm going to hit this destination and all of this obsessiveness and work goes away that's part of the mirage. It doesn't actually exist. So let's go there now. You could actually get to a weight like that, but it will require you permanently live in isolation and suffer forever. Now, now that I've been through that and I've experienced that, I know it's not worth it. Like, I don't want to go back to that place again. It's just, I feel like there's, it's so hard to let go of, you know, it's just this little nagging voice. Like every now and then, I, know. I get louder and it's quieter. Yeah. And yeah. Happens, so you haven't let it go. You haven't let it go. You still think the fantasy exists. You still think you can hit it and it'll be, you can maintain it. There's probably something in your head where it's like, but I, I shouldn't have gone to that party. I should just not go out to the restaurants anymore. You know, that's like the anorexic way of thinking. I should just stay in my bedroom. To prove what? That you're, that you won? That you're winning? So what are you really winning? Is it really something you would want to share with the world? I know. So part of this is to actually see the illusion that it doesn't even exist. Right? It doesn't exist. And I feel like I've come a long way. Like I used to consume my life and then, you know, mm -hmm. I got a lot better. And then I just, I'm at a point where I feel like I'm, in the middle of like a seesaw like mm -hmm. I can feel like I know what it is to give it up and not care I just I just need that push you know, well no one can make you do it you're the one that has to jump no one I I can't push you I can sit here and go here's what you need to do jump right so go back to this idea that you're gonna 
the truth of the body. Let's just imagine you're, if you stop everything you're doing and you become, you, you, you're done dieting. So when, when you're done dieting, you no longer believe in food morality. Food morality is basically what's taught from the diet industry. The, and know that this, know this, the diet industry is the friend down the street selling the shakes. It's, it's your aunt that's telling you to go low carb. It's your friend that's doing keto. That's the diet industry. They're all supporting food morality. It's the freaking doctor that says that gluten is going to kill you. <laughs> you hear that, the triggering of, of impact that has on the psyche, right? Yeah, especially when it comes from like family. Yeah, and you have to know that's not going to change. So do you want food to be the center of your life? the center of your thoughts, the center of your shame, the center of your feeling good? Do you want food to be what holds the control of everything in your life? Well, then we have to get rid of what is promoting this in you. Would you have this inflamed food issue if you didn't feel bad about eating? shame, right? Would you feel, would you feel bad about yourself eating something if you didn't think, if you didn't have a diet that had, you know, brainwashed you to think that way? I mean, would you feel bad about eating if you didn't have a diet that had brainwashed you to feel that way? So we could say, for example, like but when I was suffering, peanut butter was like the devil. Super high calories, right? Super high in fat. If I didn't have a diet, then just eat the peanut butter. Yeah, and you wouldn't feel shame about it. You wouldn't be like, there's something wrong with this. I've done something wrong. It's, yeah. it's threatening. It's threatening. You wouldn't have any of that. And then what would happen to your behavior when you, when you ate said food? Would you binge on it? No, because there's no, you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. So this is really important. You only binge on when you think you've done something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I have ruined this. I have failed. It is, I have failed. What are you failing? Well, you're failing the fear mongering food restriction, but why are you doing that? Because of the desire to be thinner. So let's imagine, go back to that, you'll never be thinner, ever. It's not in your cards. Your genetics don't support it. Clearly, it's not supporting it because it requires you starve yourself. If it was real, would you be starving yourself? I know. So if you want freedom from all this crazy, right, that is real. You're not crazy, but it is feels that way, right? How are you going to get freedom if you have to be thin or just thinner than you are? How are you going to get freedom? Like, you can't get freedom if you're... No. Like, the two are mutually exclusive. You got it. You can't. It's If you feel bad about your weight, that projects into your relationship with food. There's no possible way to separate the two. That's so true. Right. I'm going to say it again. If you feel bad about your weight, you're going to feel bad about your food. You cannot separate the two. So your suffering, you know, what we're consciously suffering from is the obsessiveness with food and the fact that food has the power to kill you psychologically, right? That was my biggest issue is I had food had so much power over me, not just power over my desires to eat, which was real, but it came at such a high psychological cost. It, uh, it had the power to create so much shame. I mean, total and complete horror around a the feeling of I am a total and complete failure. Food had the power to do that to me. 
Honestly, I remember thinking in the, those moments of desperate desperation to for something, um, and I became aware of a lot of things just thinking about it. I was like, I am more afraid to eat peanut butter, and I feel more ashamed of myself eating peanut butter than if I murdered a kitten for fun. I was like, I, I am basically walking around as if I am a horrible, dangerous, pathological, murderous human being. That's how bad I feel when I eat peanut butter. It's horrible. Well, and then you have the, I have to, I'm going to be fat. So there's the, it, there's the food shame yeah. that creates this, I failed. And then you get excited because you're like, well, then I, if I've already failed, I should just get in all the food that I, if I'm going to feel shame, I might as well get all the shame food in right now. Because at some point I'm either going to puke, I'm going to exercise it off so I can get back to zero. It's like penance. It's like praying for mercy, right? You know, yeah, so if like you, especially that, like, um, then like, it's just like an all or nothing. It's like, okay, I've already eaten this much calories, and I've already binged. I might as well just keep going because tomorrow I know I'm not going to binge. So just get it all. Get out. it all in, yeah. So that's the feasting before famine because you know that the food's going to go away. So right now, because you've already failed, it it, yeah. it actually feels really good in the moment. There's, it sucks in one moment, but it feels good on the other side because you actually have a moment in time to actually eat food and not feel bad about it because you've already failed. So I might as well get what I need in. And it, it's really exciting. It is. Yeah, that's the euphoria that people describe when they're binging. Yeah. It's not about the food. It's not the food that's euphoric. It's the period of time that you are free from shame about it. It's like... And you don't have to micromanage it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to count calories with it. There's no suffering involved in, the, in that period of time. And the period of time is however long you have before you re-implement the restriction. So for some people, it's weeks at a time. For bulimics, you could see it's meal for a time because you purge to be at zero right away. It's for me, like depending oh. on my emotional state, like. The yeah. momentum that, like, it can either be, like, a day or two or it can be a week. Like, it just... Yeah. So that part, don't you agree? That's, like, that's not confusing. That's really quite understandable. If you know you're going to be restricting and you know when you're going to start the restriction, it's go until that point. But you're yeah. now eating excessively with the assumption that you're going to lose the weight that you're about to gain. Well, the sucky part about it is you're not really going to, what it would require to lose that weight is an adequate amount of starvation to get you to that point. But what is the, you're going again, you're going against psychological wiring to do it. So your likelihood of binging again is like 99%. So you're just going to keep on gaining. And that's what people don't connect with. It's like, you actually think when you're gambling with this whole binge aspect that you're going to actually fix the damages. Well, no, you're not actually because your way of fixing it is actually triggering the sensitivity to binge again and again and again and again, because you have to be so perfect. You have to be so perfect. That's the all or nothing, right? The perfectionism comes from trying to recover from the binge. You have to be perfect, but don't you agree? The perfectionism is what sets you up to have such a small shift to create failure. You have to be so perfect for such a long period of time. But if you make one small move and it's not perfect. And that's, I feel like I really struggle with that because there's an aspect of like my personality that's like that as well. No, yeah. no, that's not. No, 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 no. That's wrong. Don't, don't believe that. That's a bunch of shit because it's not a personality trait. That's actually a survival mechanism. That's a symptom. It's not special to you. So this is really important because you keep on thinking it's who I am. Bullshit. This isn't who you are. This is every single human being on the face of the planet under the circumstance is this way. Anybody in survival mode is type A. Everybody in survival mode is type A. All or nothing. Kind of exciting to hear that, right? Yeah. It's not a personality trait. 
I just I felt like maybe there's something wrong with me. Like it's I know. My no, uh, no. No, and actually, there's nothing wrong with it. It it makes sense for survival. You're going to be super, super obsessed, and things are going to need to be perfect if you're like, imagine you're trying to build a shelter from a bear. Right. Just think about how important that would be, that it is far enough away, high, you know, how can they not, are they going to climb a tree because they can come, you know, you're trying to figure that out. You're going to be obsessed about it if there's an actual threat of a bear. Don't, can you see where that would be a very important symptoms in terms of survival mechanisms? So what you're yeah. describing is a survival mechanism. It is not a personality trait. It's a survival trait. And it, and you, again, go back to hundreds, tens of thousands millennia of evolution here. Don't you agree that that kind of obsessive and perfectionistic behavior would be really important. And let's just imagine you don't get any food in the winter months. So you have to preserve all the food and harvest and preserve for the entire winter month. Can you see where that need to compartmentalize and organize and obsess around quantities would be very, very important. Yeah, that makes sense. And is it just you that's wired that way? Just some people? No, every single human being, that is alive today, somewhere along in the genetics, they all had the same wiring through famine, through, you know, pestilence, through all sorts of trial. Every single one of us that's here today has a family line of survival mechanisms that allowed us to be here to get through the cold, to get through the heat, to get through the water, to get through all this stuff. We're still here for a reason. We're all wired to be that way under survival circumstances. So it, you just are, have been functioning this way for a long time now, haven't you? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to turn it off? I feel like I've reached a point of like just maturing where like I can, I'm seeing things differently and I'm realizing that it really like, it's just not worth it anymore. Like it's, I'm just tired. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's exhausting, right? It's exhausting. Should anybody have to work this hard just to be liked or loved in their own family? No. Seems a little cruel, right? Can you imagine having a child and making that child this crazy just so that you can say, well, your body is good enough right now? Wouldn't that just be devastating? Do you think your parents, if they knew what was going on, if they really understood this, that they'd be okay with it? No, they'd be so devastated. This is, they, no human being should have to live like this just to feel okay. You don't even feel good. Think of all the work you're doing and you don't even feel good. You just feel like crap. It's horrible. It's a, it's a nightmare. You're in a, like a live nightmare. Every day you wake up, you go to bed. Aren't you excited to go to sleep at night so you can get some relief? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> Remember when I said, okay, all I know is that you contacted me, which means you're miserable. Yeah. So imagine if you, in order for you to be free from this bullshit, all you got to do is be okay if gaining weight. If that's what happens, eating normal. How hard would that be, really, in reality? Let's just contemplate that. Realistically contemplate what would your life be like if you were had to... How much do you weigh right now, do you know? The last time I weighed myself was six months ago, and I was, um, it was like 94 kilos. Okay, so like 180 pounds? No, that's a little more. It's like 100, almost 200 pounds. Okay, so let's yeah. imagine you're going to weigh... Let's just imagine you're going to be 250 pounds the rest of your life. Forever. Yeah, I went there. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Well, just go there because that's to you. That's like, I mean, look at the way you're living. Which is worse? Which is worse?
So let's just go there. Go there with me. Okay. I'm not saying that's what you have to be, but just imagine if that was like the, the real body. That's like where your body, a hundred years ago, that's where you would have been. And you would have been just fine with it. So let's just imagine that, okay, I've got that genetics and 250 is about my body's reality. That's where it likes to sit for whatever reason. And it's easy. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to starve. I don't have to, which means I'm not going to binge. I don't have to have any shame around food. I don't have to have any fear around food. I don't have to have, food has no purpose or meaning really, except for I want to eat when I'm hungry. I want to enjoy the food. I want to have tasty food, but it doesn't cause any, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no fear, no shame. There's no restriction ever again, you know? So there's no, food becomes like, eh, because it's there all the time now, right? There's no shame. There's none. You don't have to go exercise to feel better about yourself. You can now just go exercise because you like it and enjoy it, but you're not going to lose any weight from it. So it can be whatever you want out of just straight enjoyment. I'm just, yeah, I've never thought of it that way. It's like, Oh, of course, if you had, we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> But think about it now. How does that sound to you? Because if it's if you just accept it, that's the way it is, then there's nothing to fix. Nothing to fix. It's like, you know, when some people are born, you know, without a with a without a leg or with a fingers or, you know, when they're born or they get in an accident and they're permanently disfigured forever, right? It's a like a sense of just peace and like acceptance, like you're just It's over. You have just the calmness and There's no yeah. pressure. No pressure, you feel that? Like I would have nothing to fix. Hmm. Like my I can like think about other things and not just devote all this mental energy just to like obsessing, you know, like it's it's like we said before, I guess it's like brain. How's that feel? Yeah. yeah. All you got to do is accept whatever weight it is, whether it's 250 pounds. I mean, wouldn't you rather that? So, and if someone thinks that you're lazy and dumb, you know what? Bye bye Go find someone who's willing to starve so you will like them. You know, you have enough experience to know that it's wrong. It's wrong what you're doing. And no human being on this planet is worth this. Not Your parents aren't worth it. If your parents were okay with your eating disorder, do you really want, do you really want their approval? No, you just got to be okay without their approval and move on. You got to at some point evolve beyond them. But you and I both know that's not the case. If they knew you're suffering with, um, this becomes suicidal eventually. That's what happens for most people. Because there's no point to living anymore. What's the point? If this is what your whole life's going to be about, is this really what life's about? It's pretty bad. Right? <laughs> So you get to the point where you're like, well, what's wrong with 250 pounds? If that's what I'm, if that's the, that's just the number I threw out there, right? That's the worst case scenario. If that's the worst physical thing you're going to experience in your life, is it really that bad? I just, I feel like I suppress it rather than think about it. I just, what do you mean? Like, I, like, if that were the worst case scenario, like I just... Like, the feelings that I get, I just, I don't know, like, instead of just, I don't know, just not, you know, you need to think through this, don't you? Because you have to really question, is there something really wrong with that to where I have to feel shame about it and repress the shame, like I'm a horrible person? Remember when I told you I walked around as if I might as well have been torturing little kittens for fun because that's how bad I felt about it. And I remember thinking all I did was eat peanut butter. Are you fucking kidding me? 
right? If I can't, and if I gain weight eating peanut butter, is that really something I should be ashamed of? This is like, should someone in China who unwraps their feet feel ashamed of themselves? Like they're a loser that can't, isn't willing to work hard. Their unwillingness, they're, they can't, they want to stand. They want to actually stand up on their feet and have some independence. Is that really, really something worthy of shame? Because they were stigmatized as um, they weren't tough enough. They weren't hardworking enough. They didn't want enough. They still... If your feet were bigger, you were stigmatized as a horrible person. So are you really a bad person if you end the misery of this torture? Should anybody, should anybody have to suffer like this just to, I need people to be proud of me, you know? I want someone to be proud of me. Should you have to do it like this just to be accepted by your friends? So, you know, and, and get them out of the picture. You're doing this for you. So do you have to suffer the way you've suffered just for you to feel like you're a good enough person? I mean, think about it. If the body that you're in is genetically predisposed to being 250 pounds at its neutral point, meaning it doesn't require binging, it doesn't require starving, it's its own Equal, like equilibrium, where it sits, how it's going to be, the way you need to be to get pregnant, the way you need to be to have babies, the way you're going to need to be, have, you know, that's, that's your natural point. Is that really worthy of shame? Em embarrassment? Is it worthy of embarrassment? No, because like that's... Uh, I know. It's not like you're torturing kittens. <laughs> like, we... Like, when you put it that way, it's like, there's no point. Like, it's what it is. You know, like. It's like saying, your hair's black. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's not blonde. <laughs> like, you can't do anything about that. I mean, like, straight and dye your hair, but that's like. Who cares? Bad. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to the person that you are. It's completely irrelevant. So are you really a shitty person inside that you have to like conform your outside to prove that you're not? Well, who knows that? Who knows that? Do I know Do I know the answer to that question? Are you a shitty person to the point where you have to conform the outside to fake it out? Who, who has the answer? You got it. And you're the one who's actually says, yes, I'm a horrible person, Robin. I'm a horrible, shitty person. To where I must hide. I have to hide and I have to like shrink myself and diminish who I am so that I don't exist so that no one knows I'm such a pathetic piece of shit. For what? What makes you so pathetic? What are you, such a terrible person? Do you torture animals in your basement for fun? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, that, then we might have a little... <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. And even if you did torture animals in your basement, I would suggest you go and get help. You know, because what brings someone to torture animals is probably horrible. And they, there's compassion for that, too. You know, but, oh, shit, you can't be the skinniest person. You're a horrible person. I'm just trying to, like... Soak it in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds yeah. fucking crazy, doesn't it? Now, this is crazy. Your issues with food, that's not really... I know you think it is, but that's like, oh, your human nature's coming out. You're like a third world animal. That's what that is. This shit, you feeling ashamed about yourself? That's fucking crazy. Like I said, make it make sense of it. Like, what have you done that's so terrible? Are you really a terrible person? Have you ever, even as a child, are you not safe to be with? If anything, it's just, I feel like it's people projecting their insecurities on you, you know, like. Now you're thinking. Now you're thinking. Yeah, if they're judgy, 
They're trying, they, they are insecure and they're projecting onto you their method of feeling secure. Right. So if their method of feeling secure is that shell of thinness, they're going to say, oh, you're not thin. Because right. they're empty and hollow on the inside too. They're totally shallow. They don't feel, they don't have a sense of worth from the inside. If they did, would they be so critical of the exterior? Not at all, right? That is the truth. So how are you going to, how do you end all of this insanity with food? Just changing the way that I think about myself and just not, <laughs> not falling into that trap of thinking that I have to, you know, like conditional love, like mm -hmm. I have to look a certain way in order to feel and be a certain way, you know, like it's an illusion. Like I, it's totally fucking fantasy. It's a weird, it's like, Imagine you don't care. Imagine you literally don't care. How would you feel about your body right now? It's just there. Like, it's freaking awesome. You got your sight. You got a luxury body. You got sight, hearing, smell. You can walk. You have all your fingers. You're standing upright. What else do you, what do you really need? What do you really need? That's so true. Like, you're conscious. Yeah. You're freaking conscious. What do you want to do with this life? It is your life. No one else is living this experience that you're experiencing. You're the one who's doing. What do you want to do with it? It's yours. If this is your body, though, this is the one you're in. Do you really want to spend your life trying to fix the body so that it's good enough for you to live in it? Or do you just want to live in it? That's so beautiful. Because if this is good enough for you, just um, this is good enough for you, and you're consciously aware that if you try to make it thinner, it's going to take away everything that you have. You become a dead soul. It's dead. You have a dead life. You might as well be chopped up and fed to the lions. Right. It's true because you you have no life. You're lifeless. You're hollow, empty. There's nothing but a body, right? Because everything is devoted to whatever you're having to do to be thin. And to feel better about binging and the binging and the food and you're just lifeless. So do you really want someone to like you based on your weight? And right? Isn't that kind of fake? That's like extremely fake. And that's actually something I really hate. Like I'm, I hate superficialness and like people and that do that. And like, well, that's you. You're doing it to yourself. Not exactly. Like I'm, you're just like that. So let's not use the word hate. You might want to think yeah. about that because you really just hate yourself and that's what you're projecting out onto others. So let's start over. If you didn't believe in thinner supremacy and you believed in body aliveness, <laughs> just think of it that way. I have a body image of being alive and that's my body image. It's I'm alive. That's all you need, right? How would you feel about the body you're in right now? Awesome. So yeah. what then happens to, oh my God, you can't eat that. If anything, like I don't, I won't internalize it. If anything, it's like a reflection of them. And like what? That's a know, diet. It's, it's just a diet. I have to see it this way, you know, it's like just, yeah. What happens to, what happens to the idea that, oh, that's bad food. That's fattening. What happens to that? If you don't, if you're good with your body right now and you're like, whatever it is, I'll take it. It's kind of like being blind to it, right? It's like, it's irrelevant. If, if I'm alive, that's all I really need. What happens to how you relate to food? Is you there, yourself. like you just know, like you eat it and it's fine. It's not like it's going to do anything to you. It's hmm. just food. Is it going to go away? Like what's going to go away? Is food, food going to go away? Not, food. <laughs> not right now. You're in a first world environment. You're not in a third world environment. Right. There's food everywhere. You can have anything you want all the time. Do you really need to have it all right now? So what happens to this like, oh, I can only have two cookies. Oh my God, I should only have. How many cookies should you have? However many 
many you feel. Yeah. Do you want to be sick? How many? No. Well, then, no. then you only eat enough to feel okay. You don't go to sickness. Yeah. You see how yeah. easy that is? Do we need to count them out in portion control? Do you need to focus on it? Or do you just go, I don't want to be sick. Therefore, I will eat relative to that. I'm not going to get sick on this. I'll have one or two. We'll see how much. I just want to taste. Do you need to go exercise afterwards? No. No. Do you have to think about it afterwards? Because if you, like, when you put it that way, you know, like, you know that the food is always going to be there. It really, it makes no sense to all just shove it in your face. Uh -uh. Right and Because like, you haven't done anything wrong. Tomorrow, like. You haven't failed anything when you eat it. Yeah. You haven't done anything wrong. Nothing's ruined. So why would you yeah. eat the whole bag? You can have it later. Like maybe like the emotional part of it. It's like if you're having a rough day, it's just. Okay, well let's think like, about that. What what defines a rough day? Yeah, I had like a stressful day and like. What defines that? I mean, okay, like, because I'm doing my master's program right now, so, like, I have, it's, like, exam week, like, midterm week, and, like, I'm stressed, and I have a lot of studying to do, and I haven't finished everything I needed to do, and so... Okay, so what, so what's the risk if you don't get it all done? Um, <laughs> not past. <laughs> okay, so that's, like, oh, is that something you should be ashamed of, like, you're gonna hurt little kittens? Is that your, is that your, I'm so smart? So, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like you need to bring everything down to reality. What if you're not that smart? Where's the stress coming from? It's kind of like, what's food going to do in that moment? Does eating food improve your chances of passing? No. Okay. So and the other thing is if that food is available at all times, yeah. what happens to the need for it emotionally? It literally goes away. So there's a, th so what I'm hearing right now is not only do you have this image of thin supremacy, but you probably have intellectual supremacy too. That's another form of, I'm a, I'm a dumb person and that's worthy of shame. So there's probably be some beliefs inside you that I'm such a horrible person. I have to prove myself through these superficial concepts of intelligence. That's a common one. Another common one is money and religion. Money, intellect, body image, religion. And body image can have like a variety, like fitness image, thin image, you know. Um, some people are bodybuilders. Some people have that sexualized body where they want to get their big, big lips. Like the Kardashians have a body image where they, you know. So you can either, so the goal is like, are you really a, sh a horrible person? Just baseline. So why can't you just use your baseline to guide things? Why do you have to go over the fucking top like a narcissist with everything? See, again, that's where I used to think, like, it was just my personality. No, but, no, you're, comp you're, comp you're compensating. So this is where the work that I would do with you, this is where we would end up going. So this is where we start going into your compensations. Because it's not just body image. You're trying to feel like better about yourself, and you're using these concepts of, like, the best. I have to be the best to prove myself. I want my parents to be proud of me. Well, why can't you just be your real self? Why do you got to be a slave to some crazy ideology that requires mental illness? Yeah. Uh, my phone is about to die. Like, it is sucked dry at 4%, and we still have 20 minutes or so. I'm going to run downstairs and grab... Um, okay. Uh, so does this make sense? Is this starting to, are you starting to like think? Maybe. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? Is this what I'm trying to do to get my parents pride or to feel like I'm good enough? Should anybody have to reach these levels of perfection? Can you get a B? Would you be so stressed if you just could get a B? You know what I'm saying? You really have to be the best. Yeah. It's just, I feel like, um, you know, like, I, to be able to see it in such a different way, it's just really, like, eye-opening for me. Like, uh -huh. like I've awesome. Been this tunnel vision for such a long time, and it's like... You lost perspective. Yeah. I've lost, I've, like, yeah, I've lost 
perspective. And that's why I felt like I needed someone, you know, to be able to see things differently. And like, I'm not going crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You just need to let yourself be real. So what? Have a good time. This is the only, you're here. You're here to enjoy yourself. Here we are. Welcome to being alive. What do you want to do? Is this what you want to do? I mean, I understand getting a master's. I'd love to get a master's, but that'll happen at some point. But do I really need to be the smartest? And do I give a shit what anybody thinks about me getting a master's? Fuck no. I wouldn't even tell people if I get it. Why would I tell someone? It doesn't matter. It doesn't, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it because it might be good for, it's something I want to do. You know? I write another book, okay? So imagine I publish another book, which I'm going to. Does it really matter when it comes to how I value myself? No. It'll be relieving when it's done. Be like, yeah, I did it. I'm glad I got that out there. I'd like to move on with my life. Right. What, what can one person do in a lifetime? If given the freedom to just take the life, because, you know, you're alive. Okay. You have, you're experiencing life. What do you want to do with it? So imagine you get hit by a car and you become a paraplegic. Does that mean that you only have half of a sense of life because you're half of your body works? No, you're still alive. You can do, you still have all that life and all that potential. You just might have a wheelchair. So what changes? Nothing. Body is still alive. It's still providing life. You're still conscious, right? You're still conscious and aware. What else do you need? So let's imagine you get, you're a burn victim and you have burned and you're deformed. You're still alive. What else do you need? Right. So does it matter what someone else, their opinion about the body you're in? It's not their body. And if they have a negative opinion about it, what does that tell you about their ability to accept life unconditionally? from the body. It's not very big ability, right? Yeah. So what I'm trying to get you to do is actually question your ability to accept a life from a body that's has actually nothing wrong with it. It's all fictitious. It's all an illusion of wrongness, right? What's actually wrong with your body? I knock on wood, I don't have any issues at all. <laughs> okay, well if you want to be thin, <laughs> now you have problems. And now you got to work. Now you got to starve yourself just to not be thin. You see what, see what, how quick and easy this could be over? Like so fast. Yeah. So if I, if your weight is naturally at 200 pounds, naturally at 250 pounds, just you being you, the sooner you can accept whatever that is, the better. That means you're free. This, as soon as you can accept it. And the key to this is you've got to accept it um, wherever it is without attaching to it. So if your body is thinner, what does that really mean? Nothing. It's irrelevant. What's the difference? What does it really mean? What is it? You know, Let me tell you, I have a lot of anorexic clients that might as well be chopped up meat fed to a lion. They literally have no life. They're lifeless. They're hollow. They have nothing. They've reached the thin supremacy, but as you have, it's basically there's nothing because you have to keep it to prove that you're a superior human being. And look, I finally feel good about myself. When in reality, you don't actually feel good about yourself at all. You just feel good about reaching a standard of body image that some culture decided you needed to for some weird illusion of being a better person. It's like the, the woman that thinks she is superior with her three inch feet. Just imagine that. Yeah. She is so amazing with her three inch feet. 
Wouldn't you rather be a loser? It's not worth it. It's just... I'd rather have my 10-inch feet. <laughs> I'd rather have my, my 10-inch feet. No joke. And be a big loser. But Because then I'm free. I'm free to do what I want with my life. I'm no longer handicapped. I don't have to... So what if I don't have a man? I'd rather not have a man than to have to suffer in complete and total misery physically and total, you know, limitation and completely um, dependent because I'm disabled, can't walk, to maintain a three foot, three inch foot that everybody's praising me for. I'd rather not have the praise. Is that, are you seeing, are you... So the girls that walk around in their thin supremacy who are like, I am amazing. I just puke up my food afterwards. It's like such a good thing. They can have it. Be like, you win. <laughs> I know. Like I, I thought like I've been there before and it's just, it's so, it's exhausting. Like you can't, I, I couldn't keep it up. No, it's worse. It's actually worse. Would you agree? It's worse. I was, like, depressed during that time. Like, I just couldn't. Okay. I couldn't anymore. Like, I, hey, just, I would yeah. really love for you to tell the video. You have, you're 200 pounds now, ish. You were down to what? I lost 33 pounds. So I was, like, 170-ish. Okay. And you were getting tons of praise. And were you happier? It, like, I thought I was. Like, I tried to convince myself that this was it. But it really wasn't because I was suffering. Like, mm -hmm. I was, ex like, mentally, physically, like, it was hard to keep up. I couldn't go out yeah. with my friends. I but your clothes out. fit better. Come on. Yeah, and I thought that was the answer, but I just... Yeah, well, be, don't you agree? It's because you don't get the freedom you thought you'd get. You're still even more paranoid. Yeah, if anything, I was even more, like, entrapped, like, because uh -huh. you, know, you have to keep it up, and you're just, like, a slave. You're imprisoned to this cycle, you know? And for what? What is it all for? Superficial. It's the illusion of success. It's like, look at me, I'm successful. Are you really? No, it's actually not at all. You acquired, it's like, I'm the top of the class, but guess what? You have no friends. You are medicating yourself. You're completely paranoid. You're competing against other people. You have no friends. Once again, you're isolating yourself. And are you really successful? No, because you're lifeless. You have no life. Nothing. It's like you're negotiating with the devil, right? <laughs> I want to be the top of the class. Okay, we'll get it for you, but you got to go into this cage. You're ours. You're now suffering in Dante's Inferno, right? You're now on the oxen. You're in the ox ring, you know, suffering as a slave to prove that you're superior. Wouldn't you rather be the last person in the class, like, I'd like to pass and pay the money, but wouldn't you rather be like the stupidest person in the class? If that's, I mean, if that's the truth of your, you know, natural effort, right? The natural effort part. God, why not? Why do you got to be the best? Why do you got to be the best? What's the point of that? To make yourself feel better about how shitty you feel about yourself? For what? Know, there's, so many, there's so many people, you know, when I think about it, like, successful people who, like, are not, like, in oh, they're their depressed. lives. Like, so many, like, we think that, like, you know, like, the most successful people, they have all this money, they have all, like, the job, they have, like, the life, but in reality, they're, like, really miserable. And so, like, it's all an illusion, and really, it's, I'm starting to realize that. Well, because you've, you've experienced it. 
you're experiencing it. How many people have the house and the family and the kids and the car and they're addicted right. to something because they're so miserable. They have the, they have the physical reality. They have a physical, the, but they're spiritually hollow. There's just, right. they're hollow inside and they've lost touch with their real self. They've become the concept that's, that's the programming. That's like brainwashing. I became programmed and I did what the program told me and I still feel hollow. I'm not free inside because you're not free inherently with the programming. Right. Okay. So that's an important thing to really think about. If your programming doesn't give you freedom or free will or current reality awareness, you'll never actually get the freedom because the means to the end isn't actually the end. It's not a means either. It's just... It's a program. There is no end to it. It's not built in reality. It's built in a fiction. It's like a fiction concept. And you're trying to create the fiction. It's like, I want what was in the story. So you create a story that's so not in your own reality. It couldn't, it's not even maybe in your scope of genetics. Not in your scope of, you know, they talk about this. It's like the good life that has been created, this idea that you're going to make tons of money, you're going to have the right car, you're going to have the beautiful house with the most amazing drapes, you have the, the amazing pool and the good life. Look at the Kardashians. They have done an amazing job. I guarantee you there is so much mental illness in that house. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I have compassion for that. I don't judge it I have because I'm human and I can understand it myself. But it's all an illusion. It's not real. It's fake. It's like this, uh, it's like this idea that we have reached the pearly gates of heaven and we're happy or we're conscious. You know, if you believe in, it's like, because my butt is so big, I've reached higher states of enlightenment. <laughs> because I've injected my lips to look bigger, I have more enlightenment. I'm so happy. You know, the physical, it's not a physical transformation. Period. The physicality, you can chop off your fingers. And what does that change? Nothing. It just makes it more complicated to tie your shoes. It doesn't change your truth, the truth of the Alma, right? The truth of the soul that existed when you were born. That you basically put in a jail cell and said, you can't come out until I'm in a thin body. And then you're in a thin body and it still can't come out because I don't have time for you. I got to keep my thin body. So it's like, well, why don't you just remove all the conditions and just say, no, that little persona, that little girl, the little soul that existed is perfect, means no harm, has good integrity, is kind and sweet and loving and really just wants to be loved and experience love. And I'm going to love that myself because I think it's good enough. No one else really knows. You know, if you look at your own parents, do they really actually love themselves? Probably not. So how are they going to love you? You just got to, you know, it's like, oh, well, they, you know, you can know that they love you, but they don't know how to do it because they don't know how to love themselves. My parents did it through religion. So they didn't know how to love themselves, but they knew how to love religion. So that's how they loved me is through religious indoctrination. Isn't that sweet? I mean, really, when you think about it, that's how much they love me. They conform me to some religious dogma. That's, that's sweet. That's love to me. It takes some evolving to see that, right? To go, oh, my mom loved me so much. She had me go to church every freaking day. That's how much she loved me. That's a lot of love, you know. Yeah, especially with my mom. Like, maybe her intentions were, they were, they were loving. They were, they were loving. You can see it and go, oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> but she, she, but she didn't know any other way to do it because that's how she was doing it for herself. So if that's what she thought would make her feel good, she's, she wanted you to feel good. So guess what she taught you? You're too fat. No one's gonna like you. You should be thin. Isn't that sweet when you look at it from distance? It's like, oh, she really does love me. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> it's really sweet. And so when you when you come to that awareness, you can forgive them. And the next time she's like, oh, my God, I'm doing this new diet. And you go, oh, mom, that's so sweet. Thank you. Yeah. I, but I am so happy with who I am. And you know what she's going to say? Oh, how did she do that? <laughs> how did she do that? How did she just love herself that way? You know, because it's really about loving your life. I love life. What do you need from the body to have life? Just that it's alive and you're conscious. Yeah. Yeah. You glad I recorded this? I'm so glad you recorded this. <laughs> yeah. Is this what you thought it was going to be? Yeah, I, I don't Yeah. No? Hell no, you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... You thought we were going to talk about eating to hunger and emotional eating. Like, because that's all I remember, like... I don't know, like, how deep... I don't know. So. It's so limited, right? That whole concept is so like, well, if you're emotionally eating, chances are you're depriving yourself. If you're depriving yourself, you believe in thin supremacy. Doesn't that sound disgusting? The whole like, isn't that kind of gross? Thin. Like, I, I can't believe that I, I felt for it for so long, though. Like, it's like. Oh, yes, you can. Just, you're raised in it. It's how does anybody who's raised in it know that that's what that is? It's like white supremacy. How many children raised in white supremacy even know that's what that is? They have no relative perspective. All I brought to you is relativity, comparison. Look at this, compare it to that. And you went, what the fuck? Literally. <laughs> <laughs> All I had to do was talk about foot binding. And you went, ding, 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 ding. I know. I'm really hoping to get this in a book so that when someone reads it, they get this experience. <laughs> the book's going to be called Thin Supremacy. Thin Supremacy. Oh, hell yeah. How do you think that's going to go? I'm probably going to get murdered. <laughs> do I care? No. No. <laughs> Thank goodness I believe reincarnation. I'll just come back. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's really important to see it first though, right? Because at least you now have some choices to make. I don't expect you to have instant recovery, um, but it certainly is so relieving to know you don't have to keep on doing this. You don't have to care about your fucking weight. You don't, you have nothing wrong. I have clients who are over 400 pounds who get this freedom because they realize the only reason why they're this big is because they cared that much. And it warped their relationship with food that much equally, right? So once you're like, I forgive the whole thing, I forgive what's happened, it's, I'm innocent. Everybody who's in it is actually innocent. Now, if I know what I know, okay, what I'm aware of right now, and I go back in and go back into thin supremacy and take advantage of people for it, now, now I got some serious karma I would pay, right? Because I'm aware of what it is and I would be taking advantage of people for it. That's criminal to me. Right? So it's not like everybody out there is doing that. How many people in the diet industry you know this shit? They're freaking clueless. Yeah. So you can't even be upset about it. It's like, oh, this is so ancient. It's such an ancient, archaic, human survival mechanism around trying to feel safe based on someone's image. Get over it. If you're not, you're going to be, you're going to be very much, um, easily manipulated by the next body image that seems really cool. Yeah, I just...
It's so true. <laughs> it's so yeah. yeah. So your all of your food issues will disappear into thin air, literally thin air, when you are done with this baggage. Because your food will no longer be threatened. Your food will no longer be bad. There won't be any shame or guilt around it. If you hold on to, I can't gain weight or I need to be thinner, you're going to have issues with food. Right? You can see how you can't separate the two. So if we get rid of this whole concept of thin supremacy and you stop believing it is real. You stop thinking of the fantasy, oh, but Robin, I want to get married. Okay, well, you want to get married to a thin supremacist? Is that what you want? <laughs> or do you want to find a mate that doesn't give a shit and actually connects with the heart? Do you want a heart relationship or do you want an image relationship? Which one would you rather? Obviously well, then you need to connect at your heart. You have to connect here to then actually connect to someone else's heart. You need to connect with your own. And that happens irrelevant to the body and the image of the body. It's like when you twist your ankle and your heart's twisted because your ankle's twisted. No, the body has no relevance to the heart. Someone who's a paraplegic isn't half a soul because they only have half a body. It's like it's irrelevant. There's still the essence of the soul that exists, whether they're you know, lose their arm at war, whether they get burned victim, the same soul exists, the same essence of life. The body is still conscious. What else do they need? Do they really need someone else to say, oh, no, you're not ugly. I like you. You're beautiful. Do they really need that? It's crazy, like, how, you know, this whole industry makes you not see that. Like, it's... Well, you, you um, weren't consciously aware of it, so how can you see it if you have no relative comparison to know that this is a program? You, 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 it's impossible, and that's, that's where it's, it's very pervasive, and it's elusive, too. It's pervasive and elusive around, like, you can't see it. Especially if you're in survival mode yourself, if you're in that lower animal state of mind, it's very difficult to not grasp towards it because it's the promise is that you'll be loved. And not only that, but there's people that live in it that they got married because she was hot. So there's examples of it. The woman that bound her feet to three inches had five men that wanted to marry her and they all were really rich. Can you see how that would make that's that that's happening? Cause these people believe in it. You just have to surrender the richness that you think you want if you don't want to be paralyzed. Do you really want to put on your resume, I'm thin and hot? <laughs> right? It sounds dumb. I know it sounds dumb, doesn't it? But how many people are living this? I know, because you don't put it on your resume. People can see it. I'm thin and hot. Look at me. Yeah. I don't know. Whether you're thin, whether you're fat, if you care, you're screwed. It's like saying whether your feet are small, whether your feet are big, if you care, you're screwed. The key is not caring. If you don't want to be controlled and limited by that, then don't believe it. Don't believe in thin supremacy. Look, see the illusion and laugh because it's fucking funny. And how many, and then all of a sudden your eating disorder shit will just dis, it literally disappears. Mine did. And I had horrible, horrible bulimia which is binge eating and anorexia all together. So, all right, my dear, I got to go. Um, what were you wanting to do? Was this it? Is this what, was this what you were hoping for? Did you want to keep on working together? What were your plans? Um, I feel like I'm, I want to like sit on it for mm -hmm. a little bit because I feel like this was, I really needed this.